and welcome to another episode of the Credit Authority. Once again, I am your host, Rhonda Kulch, and I'm so excited that you tuned in today. We have a fantastic guest, and I'm excited to have my friend Mike Delaquilla on with us today. He is a serial entrepreneur, a crazy good guy, a philanthropist, a dad, and most importantly, I think he's going to be an inspiration uh, to everybody that's listening by the time they are done hearing his story. So, Michael, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Rhonda. Hey, should I change my name there to my last name, by the way? No, you're fine. <laughs> for those of you that are listening, we're also videoing this. So Mike's trying to figure out if he should put his uh if he should put his full name on the video. Yeah. Now we got you, Mike. That's Don't worry. It'll go, great. It'll go through. It. Yeah, it goes through edit. So you have a great story. So obviously you and I, um, we've known each other for a long time. We reconnected, what do we figure? Nine think, years ago, ten yeah, years right. ago. At the event, yes, the box. Yeah, when we both did the Long Island Fight for Charity. Yeah. Uh, but you have a great story. So tell us a little bit about who you are and your journey as an entrepreneur. Um, okay, so I'll bring it right back to when I was a kid, you know. Um, I actually, I did go to college. I went to high school. I went to Smithtown like you, um, mm -hmm. high school. And then I went on and I didn't know what I really wanted to do. I wasn't, I really wasn't the best in school unless I kind of really was focused on something. So I, I just didn't love sitting in a classroom, but I did it. And then after high school, I did go on to college and I, um, I just came out with a, an originally a bachelor's degree, I mean, a associate's degree, uh, from, uh, Fairley Dickinson university. And, um, I came out and I still didn't know what I want to do. So my degree was in business and marketing. That was it. Um, and I just wasn't sure, but, my um, grandfather in the, it was probably in the seventies started a, uh, maybe the eight early, yeah, late seventies started a small car dealership. Um, and he and a partner, my grandfather was in sales. The partner was more of the tech in the technical end. They started a small dealership in uh, Freeport, Long Island. And it was a BMW dealership actually. So, and BMW back then was really nothing. Um, and my grandfather, I think he invested $50,000, which back then was a lot of money, actually. Um, it was his life savings, actually. So he did it. He was older at the time. And um, I mean, he had to be in his six, maybe around 50, late 50s, 60. And he did it. And um, he actually, uh, they they started, he was a 25% owner and the other person who was more of the operations, business, administrative was more of the... Uh, the back end and and technical. So, um, so I didn't know what I wanted to do, but when, when I got out of college, but at the time, right before I got out of college, my, my grandfather's partner passed away and my father took over. He, my father was the vice president of Farmingdale college and he was an accountant actually. Um, and he was an accountant professor there. He was a businessman all the way. Um, so he had the regular job with the benefits and everything. He wasn't as much of an entrepreneur. My grandfather and I were much more of an entrepreneur. We had that 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 thing in it. Like when I was a kid, I used to sell and buy cars and do everything. So long story short, my father took over and my grandfather pretty much retired because he was probably in his mid to late 60s when that happened. And um, I believe, yeah. And he retired. My father bought out uh, my grandfather and the widow of the partner who passed away. So now my father left the college to do that full time. He was in his forties already. So I was already 17, 16, maybe a little younger. Um, I was go, I was get, going to college. And then when I got out, my father had the BMW dealership and he was doing okay. It was, he was selling 10 cars a month and BMW was not what it is today. It was, actually it was kind of looked at it like an old man car back then. And it was, it was still based on performance or a race car, even like it was just like either one of those. It wasn't necessarily this hype, this car, that high performance, unbelievable ultimate driving. They, they use that phrase, but it wasn't really seen at that, at, at, except the race cars they made. So I got out of college. I didn't know what I want to do. And I basically started selling cars, um, but not for my father. He didn't want me. We decided it wouldn't be good to work together. So I actually went to a dealership in West Iceland, Long Island, and just applied. And I went to the first, it was called an auto mall. So there were four dealerships right next to each other. Um, they were all connected, but you go through each showroom to the other. At that time, they were allowed to have franchises together where 
they don't allow that really anymore. Um, so, for example, Volvo is Volvo, they're Volvo. If they're BMW, they're BMW. I walked in the first job. I remember like it was yesterday. Um, I walked in. I applied for a job as a salesman. I got some cheap suit on and whatever. <laughs> and I, I walked in and I applied for a job at the cat, uh, Nissan showroom. And they left me sitting there for like an hour. They never came. And then they came up to me and said, ah, you know what? The manager's not here. You know, we can't see you today or whatever. So I walked out, went to the next showroom, next door. I didn't realize it was the same owners. I just, I was a kid. <laughs> I was 21 years old. Went to the next showroom. It was Cadillac. I still remember this. Sat there for an hour, waited. Um, then they came up to me and said, you're not, you know, we're not hiring for Cadillac right now. He said, okay. Went to the next showroom, right? And this is how persistent I've always been in my life. And I went, it was a Jeep showroom. So I went in the Jeep showroom and the general manager of the whole place came to me and goes, you're really persistent, man. He's like, you just applied for three jobs in the same company. And I said, <laughs> I, said I want to sell cars, man. I want to sell cars. So he's like, um, you're, we're going to hire you. He said, we're going to hire you and we're going to give it a shot. And you're going to be a trainee. And they throw me into the job. There was no training back then. It just wasn't the way it was. Um, they throw you in, you study some materials, you watch some videos, you learn the product from the owner's manual. And I started selling one Saturday. It was busy. And he's like, go ahead, take up. They call them ups at the time. He's like, take it up, take it up, take a cause. And I just hit hit the ground running. And I actually, within six months, I became their number one car salesman in that Jeep showroom. So a promotion back then, Jeep wasn't what it was today either. Still popular, but not today. A promotion in the car business was Nissan. It, Nissan was a hot, it's still hot, but it was very hot back then. Um, so they promoted me to the Nissan showroom, gave me a car to use everything. And then all of a sudden I was like top salesman and, and probably within a year or so, um, I was going with the flow. I just, I loved it. So that was, that's the biggest thing I always tell everyone when you're doing what you love. I, I just loved it. I love being around people talking, selling, and I did everything legitimate. I never screwed anyone, lied to anyone. I just, just sold cars. So, um, I was very happy. I, I actually made $35,000 my first year in business. Um, and first year, I was happy with that. I was a kid. Um, so my father and I talked and he said, um, you know what? I'm at the BMW dealership. I'm starting to do well here. Do you want to do something together? I couldn't own anything yet. I was too, you know, I was still a kid. I was in my early twenties. And then he's like, but you want to come? I'm thinking of buying the Jeep dealership down the road from us it, where he was in Freeport. So I said, he said, I'm going to put it across the street. I'm going to buy the building, put it across the street. So we did it. And I ended up at the Jeep dealership with him two years after I started in the business. And then I started in sales with him and he wanted me to prove myself and, you know, everything again. And um, he also made me go back and finish my, he was big on college. Um, I didn't necessarily need it. I was starting to do oh, good. I mean, for me, good back then it was forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a year. I was happy. I got an apartment with a friend and I was good. Um, so bottom line is I ended up in the, um, the dealership with my father and I, the managers were horrendous. They were coming in, going out, coming in. And while I was doing this, I was getting my bachelor's degree at SUNY Old Westbury. So, because he was like, I don't, you can't work for me unless you get your college degree. I said, okay, I'll get it. So, um, he was tough. He was tough. He was a tough Italian businessman and tough, um, tough at home, tough that work. Um, so I ended up, uh, one point, I think a couple of years, it was two years later, we, we must have went through 10, 15 managers. I went to him. I said, just let me manage the store. I said, I was like 24 or 25. I said, these guys are terrible. I'll take care of it. So he's like, well, I'll give you a chance temporarily, he said, until I find the right person. I just don't think you're ready yet. I think you're too young. And that that was the end of that. I became the manager and there was no one. I, it was sailing on from there. I I ran the showroom. I was probably the youngest manager on Long Island for, again, but I was really into it. I loved the job. So basically, I ran a showroom and we grew from eh, selling 15, 20 Jeeps a month to 100 uh, over like a three or four year period. Became like number two or three on Long Island. Um, had the best customer service. I was very, very um, process driven manager and everything was systems and systems. And I just, I, I have a little bit of like 80, uh, for real, ADHD and OCD, like, <laughs> but, it, but it actually has helped me in business. I'm very zoned in on what I want to do. When I like something, I am doing it 100% period at the end. Uh, when I don't like something, I'm not, I can't even focus. Like, it's just the way. So, um, and I, it has actually helped me. Um, so um, that's it. I, I started running the dealership, ordering the cars. 
we we grew the stores. He was growing BMW. I was growing Jeep. Then we bought a Volvo dealership and put it into the Jeep store. You were allowed to do that. Became like top Volvo dealership. And then long, I'll, I'll, I'll get to the end of this now. And yeah, then we're going to have to cut it um, okay. for a quick commercial break. Do you want to hold that thought right there while we go yeah. to commercial? Yes. Thank you. Got you. It. All right. And welcome back. We are with Michael Delaquilla, and we are talking about entrepreneurship and the journey to entrepreneurship and really how he got started in his career. So, Michael, you were telling us all about your journey, about how you really became Long Island's youngest general manager of a very successful auto store. But yes. let's just jump into what does an auto career look like? So there are people that are in sales. There are people that are in management. You literally, you went up the ladder and you learned all the steps necessary to really be able to effectively run an auto dealership. For the people that are listening that are in the auto space, in your opinion, what is the most challenging part that you had running the dealership? Okay. Yeah. And like, I, like I said, we ended up with five dealerships, seven buildings. We bought all our buildings and I was running, I was operations manager for them. So I got a, I was, I understood the business service parts, sales, everything within, by the time I was 27, 28 years old. And the hardest challenge in the car auto business for the deal, for the auto dealers is a hundred percent processes because a car business is very, it, it seems like it's, probably easy. Well, you sell a car and that's it. It's not easy. There are five to six businesses running in one under one roof and they all have to communicate with each other. So there's a sales department new, there's a used sales department. Then there's the banking side, the finance, you got to get people loans. You got to deal with banks. You got to get people with credit issues, non-credit issues, leases, finances, uh, lots of stuff going on there. So the sales department has to communicate with the finance department and they're all different sections of the dealership. And then Nothing happens unless everyone's cooperating, but you can't speak kind of running around. So it all has to be done, you know, even then electronically to some degree when I was in it. But, um, you know, now it's everything's electronic. Sometimes the buildings aren't even in the same as a service building. So a, a car is sold in this building has to be prepared in that building and you have to communicate and everything has to flow. And so basically when you sell a car, that's just step one. Then you have to make sure the car goes through finance department and make sure you get the loan or the lease or whatever the custom, however the customer's paying and do all the financial paperwork properly. Then it has to go, the car itself has to go through the service department and get prepared. And if you promise the customer certain things, like well, they, if they bought extra items on the car, it has to, that has to be communicated. So it goes on. And then you have to get the parts from the parts department to put on the car. And all these are different sections of the, and everyone's worried about their department doing well and highly performing. And at the end of the day, that car needs to be ready. Um, the way you promised the customer and all these departments have to communicate. And in some dealerships on Long Island sell four, 500 cars a month. But I used to tell my employees, we can't sell 30 cars if we don't have our systems right. I said, we can sell a hundred cars easy if our systems are right. And 30 is going to be a nightmare if our systems aren't right. So I said, I, I said, but once we got our systems right and everybody's communicating and the process is you can sell 200 cars because just flowing. And mm -hmm. so all these departments have to get on. And then there's just regular business. People are walking into parts, buying parts. People are going into service to get the car service. So it's not just about selling cars, you know? So there's a lot of stuff happening in a dealership. And when you call a dealership, you'll see like the phone systems are generally a nightmare because first of all, they don't have good process and they don't take, sometimes they don't take it seriously. The, the, um, so they hire just someone random to answer phones. Well, the phone system is the key because when you, when you, when you make, when you call a dealership, you get bounced all over the place. And you get frustrated and you don't tend to hang up. So all these departments, from that point, everything has to flow. And from the phone system to what department, to where the call should go. And, and also even driving in the parking lot. Like I've driven into parking lots and been like, because I've done some consulting for dealerships now. And I've driven in parking lots and been like, there's no parking, I'm leaving. So you need to have an area for customers to park. You need to have the place clean. People shouldn't be smoking. They should be clean, no debris. Unfortunately, the car business is still not, mo there's a lot of great dealerships, but there's still some living in the past. So, but I would say systems and processes are the key. 100% the biggest challenge to running a car dealership day to day. I mean, there's many other challenges. 
dealing with the manufacturers and all kinds of other stuff. And but I'm talking about running operations. That's the issue. That's the basis. Yeah. When you were running operations for all the dealerships, you were still, you know, I, I will say younger than somebody who normally would have been in your position. Did you get any pushback from people that you hired that oh, felt yeah. that they knew more than you? How did you handle that? When my father first announced he was making me the sales manager at 24, 25, I had one or two older guys quit. Um, they were like, I'm not working for a 24 year old guy. And then I, it's all about doing the job right. I, 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 I'm a very fun and funny guy outside of uh, work. People used to think I had two personalities. They'd be like, I didn't even know you had a sense of humor, but I was like, <laughs> I didn't hang out with employees. I, when I walked in the dealership, I did my job. I was not their friend. I did what I was supposed to do. And that's one thing I tell everyone, whatever you do, take it seriously. Like, like whatever, even if it is a fun thing, but take it seriously. And then I would, they saw the lighter side of me when, you know, we went out for maybe a, a, a company party or event or something like that. But when I was in the dealership, I was all business, which is, was my boxing name, as you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I walked in and I got the job. I knew exactly what my day was planned out. And what happened when I gained the respect of them, that's it. I remember leaving, I was running just the Jeep Volvo store. And then when I became operations manager of all the stores, I actually went to the other Volvo. We ended up going to the North Shore of Long Island. With, we traded in our Volvo store for two Volvo stores. We traded in our South Shore Volvo store to two North Shore Volvo stores in Glen Cove and Huntington. And I remember when I left the Jeep store, some of the older guys were like, Mike's, his shoes are hard to fill, man. Like, like they like, and so I gained the respect of a lot of them over time. But in the beginning, yeah, it was a little rough. And sometimes people will come for a job and be like, this kid's running the store. And they, my nickname was the kid, actually, in the beginning. In the beginning, I couldn't shake it. Like, I have a couple of friends still I talk to and they're like, you were the kid. You were the, you were the kid who ran the dealerships. But it was a little hard. But once I, once I showed them, like, like how... I did did business and they they respected me. They came to me for help. They came to me for advice. They came to me, um, but I had to I had to earn it. Had it took a little while. Yes, definitely. It was a now. My last question before we have to go to another commercial break is: a lot of times you have two different sets of parents. The parents that are all about go out and go to college and go out and have you know experience in the workforce. Do you think that for how you pivoted into your career, how important was it that you went back to school since your dad required that for you in order to take on that next leadership role? Yeah, for me, it, it didn't mean anything. I mean, I, I'm not trying to put it down. I nope. believe, I, I believe I'm nor nor am I looking for that. Yeah. I'm just trying to get a gauge. I, I think what I, happens I, that didn't. Yeah, what helped me is running the dealership. That that's hands on. That was a very specific job. I learned, I did go to 30 days of school to run dealerships that even helped, that didn't even help as much as being in the dealership and just doing it. And I didn't have a lot of people to learn from. I just jumped in and did it, but I was so into it that I was excited every day to wake up and go do it. And if I didn't know how to do something, I'd figure it out. Or I'd, I would ask people obviously, or I'd research it, whatever, but that's because I loved it. But like, if you didn't love it, then it's just a job you're moping into it. I was never like that. So I mean, I worked 12 hours almost every day and I, you know, it was hard seeing my kids. I, then I had, I know, later on I had kids and stuff and it was hard because we were there a lot at the dealership. Um, but yeah, no, I, my college, I just got through it. I just, just literally got through it. I just wanted the degree in my hand. And, uh, I mean, I'm not saying I didn't learn anything. I will tell you what, I learned more this going back to school than I did right out of high school, right out of high school. I could care less about anything. I just wanted to make money and get out of there. The second time I went back for the, I did it over a few year period while I was working. I learned more because I took it a little more serious and took the classes I wanted to take. And to be honest, if I was going to go back to school again now, now I would only take things I'm interested in. And that is a big thing. Like I like, I would love to go back. I, there's sometimes I wish I would have focused more, learn more or took classes I really was interested in because it wasn't necessarily always business I was interested in. I'm a very creative kind of guy. And there were things I've now I'd love to learn, like, but I would go if I'm paying my money for college or go back to school, I'm picking what I really am interested <laughs> in. Yeah. So. Well, life throws curveballs at us. And, you know, I know that you have so much more to talk about because, again, you are what I call a serial entrepreneur. And, um, I love that you have so much experience. So we are going to get ready to pause for another quick commercial break. Um, but when we come back, what I want to jump into is your career in commercial real estate 
and how you got involved in commercial real estate, and more importantly, some lessons and some advice that you can give to people that are thinking about getting involved in commercial real estate, because it's not all... um, It's not all glory at the end of the day. So with that, we are going to take a quick commercial break. Stay tuned. We are speaking with Mike Delaquilla, and we will be right back. And welcome back. I'm so glad that you did not change that dial because we are with special guest Mike Delaquilla talking all about entrepreneurism and more importantly, his career path and how he got started in the industry and what makes him a creative. So I know that we've already spoken about your background in automotive, which we barely touched, right? I mean, you and I can probably talk for hours about the auto industry and what that looks like for somebody that's really interested in learning more about that space. But what I want to jump into now is commercial real estate and how you got involved in commercial real estate, because I think that started as a pathway from you being involved in the auto industry. Yes, definitely. Um, yeah, I always tell people I had two careers, um, auto, the auto career, and then my entrepreneurship and real estate. And that was my second career. And that's what I do now more. Um, so I was in the car business, for, I think it was 17 years, but at the end, my father really, hey, you know, he was, the, I ended up part owner with him in the dealership. So he didn't give me anything for free. Like I, I worked for it. I actually earned it. <clears throat> um, and then we, he, one thing he did teach me is he didn't buy anything unless we owned the property, nothing. So he, the first dealership from the day he started, he's like, I'm not buying out my um, grandfather's partner unless I own the property. And that was a smart move. He was an accountant. He was a businessman. He was smart. <coughs> Excuse me. So every single thing we bought, we bought the real estate. Um, except maybe a storage lot here or there or something like that. But we always bought the real estate. So as I got older, into my 30s, him and I bought a couple together. So, But even before that, I always was interested in real estate. So what I would do is um, I started buying my own stuff with money I had from running the company. And (coughs) excuse me, I'm sorry. Anytime I had extra money, I would go buy, I would try to buy a piece of property. Now that back then, first it was my home, but my first home was a two family house in Long Beach. And I lived in the upstairs and rented the downstairs. And I had a roommate, so I had rent from him and the downstairs and, and me. It cost me like four or five hundred dollars to live there, and that was my first feel of wow, these guys are giving me money every month and paying my bills basically. So <clears throat> I then a, a few years after that, I was in the Poconos and I saw things for seventy thousand. I I bought something there. I put five percent down, thirty five hundred bucks. Bought it, rented it, kept it. I sold that eventually when the prices went to like. 200,000. But I was like, wow, I made 100,000 on that. And then while I was running the company and had a family, but this was my, like, kind of what I, I enjoyed it. So then I, when I bought my house, I sold my Long Beach house. And then I, my house, I renovated I kind of a little bit and we lived in it for a few years. I was married. I got married and I, we started having kids. And then as time went by, I just kept upgrading. So my first house was in Babylon and I put some money into it and sold that and made money. So I, it kept happening. So I was on a string of like, could I could do no wrong, but it, <laughs> but it doesn't, it, it definitely, that's not true, which I'll tell you about. So I kept <laughs> doing that and I went to, I bought a house in Massapequa on the water and it was a bomb fixer upper, but I got lucky again and I bought it for, I can tell you the price was like 700,000. Everyone thought I was nuts. And that was like in 2000 and um, the market went through the roof. I put about 300,000 into it. I sold it for like one seven. Um, so I was like, holy shit, I just made $700,000. I'm just being honest. Like I'm, yeah, I'm, of not, course. I'm not bragging about it. Just, it was happening. So now I'm making the money at the dealership. So what happened was, and then my father and I owned a couple of commercial properties, but we had mortgages on them. So we had a couple, two of the three of the properties were his and mine and three or four, four other properties were his alone. Um, and then, um, at some point, Along the way, my father, he was tired. He he didn't want to do it anymore. He didn't want the dealerships were so big. We had almost 300 employees. 
I had 17 managers reporting to me. It was nuts. The manufacturers were asking us to build bigger and bigger buildings and move things around in lots and warehouses. And I think our last building we built was $10 million in Freeport. It was a service center for BMW. <clears throat> he just had it. And so I'm going to fast forward. A public company bought us out. They bought the whole, we were going to keep one or two small deals, but he was ready to go. He was ready to retire. He, he was, was like, done. <laughs> so he became, they gave him a consulting job and they made me the op manager of all the dealerships. So they public company bought us out. So I was running seven, I was still running, but now I was running. I was the main, I was, they called me the platform president or market area president. So I was in charge of all in New York and I did it for three years. They paid me a lot more than my father did. <laughs> um, so, but Dart, but we kept our properties again and they leased them back from us. So over a few year period, I still had some of my own stuff, but then, um, and then I went from my Massapequa house and I went over to like the North shore of Long Island cause I was running a dealership in Glen Cove. And that's when I got hurt. I actually bought a house and I got, I took a bad hit on that house. I put a lot of money into it, sold it in the top market. So I was realizing like it's not always going to go up. So I, and I took a really big hit on that and I was knocked off my feet and it happened twice to me. And I was like, wow. Like, and then, so over that period of time, then the 08 market crash. So thing, and that wasn't all rosy. Uh, trust me. It was like, there was some blows, big time blows, like where I was like, wow, I, I got to pull my, pull it back together. Like I just lost a lot of money. So, um, so, but the dealership, we still had the commercial properties we were getting rent from the public company. And then I was running it. And at some point I looked at my commercial properties that I had, my father started selling off his commercial properties. He was done. He didn't want it. And unfortunately he has dementia now and he's in a home. So he, he got rid of all his properties and I kept mine. I bought out my father um, of the two or three properties him and I had together. And then I kept my residential stuff. Um, and over, I was looking at the numbers and I was like, I haven't seen my kids. They're growing up. I want to coach their teens. I want to be involved. And I'm really not happy working for a public company. I really want to, you know, I just wasn't the same as being in a private. So I did three years with them. I And I asked to get out of my contract and they did. And they asked me to take a year off, like a non-compete to not go in the car business. And I never went back. I did some consulting. I thought I'd be right back running things. And I did some consulting. I actually ran a dealership in West Isa for seven months or just to help get it set up. And I've done some of that, I've gone back to dealerships to help, but I pretty much looked at my money and I was like, I was going to take a hit. I actually sold my house in, in, in like the North shore of Long Island. Cause I downsized. I said to my wife at the time, uh, I said to her, we need to downsize a little bit because I want to, I want to be around more and I want to just do real estate. And I looked at the money and I was like, we can make this work. Cause I had a couple of the commercial properties that were about to be paid off already. I was in my forties early 40s and i was like and i have some other stuff and that's how i got into full-time real estate and then i was dabbling different things the commercial properties the real residential and to be honest i little by little got rid of all the residential i sold them all off um and in that period of time too i was dabbling little businesses entrepreneurship not happy with it like retail businesses like a fitness center part of a restaurant i got rid of all of it because i found a niche in the commercial real estate, which is what I do now. And it's a very specific niche and they're called triple net leases. So I don't know if you want me to talk about that a little bit. Yeah. I think just for the sake, we have a couple of more minutes. Explain what makes the triple net leases your, your product of choice. So in the beginning I was doing commercial products, dealing with the dealership tenants. I was dealing with, uh, you know, very emotional tenants, uh, like in residential, I got rid of all, I didn't want it. So I just didn't want to deal with people evicting people. I didn't want to do any of that. I didn't want people calling me my toilet bowl's broken. Like, oh, I don't need that stuff. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I was like, I'm not doing this. So I actually sold off like some multifamily houses, some residential. And then I said, let me see. So what happened was one of the leases we, we did on the, the dealership was called the triple net lease. And the triple net lease is net of all expense, net of insurance, net of taxes. Uh, and it's basically you, they handle everything, net of maintenance. They handle everything. You give them a little better deal. Like, let's just say you can make eight or 10% on a shopping center, but you're going through hell. You know, like they're calling you every day. There's tenants in and out. There's five, 10 stores in there. This is, these were one tenant per buildings, but they were for very high investment grade companies. Like the company that bought us was a publicly traded company worth, you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. I'm not renting to like Joe's hardware, you know? So mm -hmm. I, let's say I would normally get 8% a year on, on rent. I'm just using a number. 
I would take 6% from them, but they never called me. They never bothered me. They pay the taxes on the building. They pay the insurance. I kept insurance policies on my building anyway, just always wanted it. But I, I, I never had, um, I never, um, I didn't pay the taxes. I didn't pay the maintenance. They never called me for anything once in a while. If there was something that happened structurally to the building, they'd call me to look at it. Or if they needed my approval to like do any repairs to the building or, or so it's like a real net net. It's net lease. You basically, they call it mailbox money. Um, because once you invest in it, you're probably not going to hear from them too much unless something major happens. Um, that's a triple net. They are double net. There are double net leases. They're all single net leases. I focused on triple net leases. And then I started turning them around and buying more. And I can talk to you about that. If I, you want. I love it. We're, we are going to take a quick commercial break. Um, and then we're going to bring you right back on. So stay tuned. We are speaking with Mike Delaquilla. Stay right there. Thanks. And welcome back. Once again, we are speaking with Mike Delaquilla, serial entrepreneur, talking about his experiences in the auto industry, as well as with commercial real estate. But, you know, I know we can talk all day about all your stories. I know you and I offline, we've spoken about a lot of your stories and experiences, but I think it would be a good time to also talk about your hobbies because mm -hmm. you kind of hinted before, you know, you're a funny guy. I mm -hmm. didn't know you were a funny guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no one knows that. Like that's why people used to be like, wait. <laughs> so like I, over the years, I have social media and the people that follow me through business, they used to think of me as all business. They called me all business. So they called yeah. me boss. They called me, and I'm not trying to be like that. They just they just looked at me one way and they didn't know I had a personality at all. They thought I was like, you know, but I actually am very have a very good sense of humor and I have a lot of fun. I'm very creative, but when I'm in a job, I'm very serious. It's just the way I am. Um, and I'm there and not just a job, hobbies too. I take everything I do. I, I don't look at it like a joke. Like I'm there for a purpose, even if it's a hobby, but, but I have fun. Don't get me wrong at, at a hobby, but <clears throat> I, I'm there to learn if I'm going to invest my time in a hobby, I'm going to take it seriously. So so basically, um, yeah, over the years, they didn't know that. So I started my creative, but I was always in marketing and advertising. Now, that was what I did well for the dealerships. I would promote them mar and market the dealership. And back then, it was like in the newspaper and stuff. So you had to be really creative to get people in. Um, a couple of commercials and things like that, but not as much social media back then. And then we got into the social media later. But yeah, so at, at, when I left... I, I like I said before, I got into the triple net leases, which didn't require as much time because now I was buying these properties that once they were bought, they really didn't bother you much. They just sent you a check every month unless something serious happened or they were going to like leave or which they very rarely left because I even turned over the dealerships truck properties to be to, and I bought like a Walgreens property, a, a CVS property, those kind of properties, um, things that they stay for 10, 15, 20, maybe more years. And, you know, so I, so at that point I was turning them over and there's, there's something called the 1031 exchange you could do. So you don't have to pay your capital gains taxes if you buy something else, but that's, there's more, you know, there's more to it, but I learned the niche and because I started getting away from those high maintenance properties and just doing these net triple net leases, which I do a lot of research on before I buy them. Cause there's a lot of different, uh, there's a lot of different variables to why I buy what property. It's not just, Oh, buy that one CBS. Um, it's, it's where it's located and so on. But I ended up having a lot more time. So <clears throat> I started coaching my son's teams. I started, um, you know, volunteering and I loved coaching like sports, youth sports. And, you know, but I took it serious. We won four championships in a row. <laughs> I had these six and eight year olds out there like till mid till seven, eight o'clock at night. The parents thought I was nuts, you know, but I'm like, we're winning. We are winning. We're going to try. Um, so, um, but I did it in a good way. I wasn't one of those maniac fathers, you know? <laughs> so um, over time, I just, if I was interested in something, I'd study up on it. And one of the things I always liked, and I always, well, I always worked out when I was younger, always worked out. And that's why I bought part of a gym, which I did not love. I did not love owning a gym. It took away from my passion of being in fitness. But over time, I was like working out. So I joined this little boxing club in Glen Cove and the owner there, the manager there of the club was like, you know, they do a charity event every year um, to uh, for a boxing event. And I boxed a little when I was younger, um, but like when I was really young, like 18, 19 years old. And then 
<clears throat> I always did martial arts. I actually am a blue belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, which is like mid-level, but it's still hard. And I got hurt a couple of times, injured in those classes. So I stopped doing the jiu-jitsu because you're rolling around the floor with these monster guys like that are 20 years old. But I love that too. <clears throat> and I, um, but then I really love boxing. So I love the fitness of it. I love the, I love the workouts. I love the competition. I just loved it. So um, I ended up doing, you know, a charity event for boxing, took it very seriously, got in the best shape ever, worked at, hired the best boxing coaches I could find. Um, I was going to the Glenco Boxing Club every night, every morning, and I ended up boxing in an event, which is also when I started to see you again. And then you, John, did it, did it too. So, um, and it is, it was a great event. It was a great night. And, and I kept boxing after that. I always have boxed, but, uh, more for fitness and uh, fun. And so boxing is a big hobby of mine. Working out is a big hobby of mine. I like work. I love working out, lifting weights. Um, and then recently during COVID, um, my um, my niece and my brother's wife, first wife died of cancer. So my, he was young. He's remarried now and he lives out East, but he, um, his kids are older now. He raised his kids and um, they do some, I guess there was some fundraisers with breast cancer and things. So I remember I was going to an event for breast cancer and we, I had a, I had a write up a five minute comedy routine. So I, I'm actually really funny. So I, I have always, <laughs> um, and people on social media were like, where, who is this guy? Like, like, I didn't even know you were funny. So, um, but I like, I like making, I, I like having fun. I love, I love, you know, I like, to be, you know, have fun, laugh and, you know, and that kind of stuff. But I, I, so I said to myself, I always wanted to try stand up comedy. So a few years, so a few years ago during COVID times, I took a course online. I took, I wrote up a five minute routine on my own. I did it. And the producer there was like, you did really well. He's like, um, you want to come back and do another show. So I started doing shows and about four years ago and I became an amateur stand up com comedian and I take it very seriously. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. And I've done, I don't know, maybe I've probably done 40, 50 shows. I've been in the city. I've been to Gotham, Governors. Um, I've hosted shows. And then most, more recently, just last weekend, um, I entered a contest that had 51 Long Island comedians, you know, amateur comedians working their way up. And, but they were good. They're really good. And it, it was a contest who NASA was a Nassau County comedy contest. And I worked, I got down to the semifinals, then the finals. And then there were 12 people left at a 51. Then there was four people left me and then I won the contest. So once again, I take it very serious. So I just, so I, I do stand up comedy and fitness <laughs> are probably my biggest hobbies, I would say. And I look at real estate like a fun venture, but it's business, but <clears throat> that's what I really do. You know? So those are my hobbies, comedy, fitness, writing, working out, boxing. Those are the things I like to do on the side. I think that's hysterical. I know that the first time I saw you on social media, I did the same as everybody else. I'm like, huh, I didn't know Michael was funny. <laughs> like that actually still makes me laugh. Very weird. You being funny makes me laugh. <laughs> it, it's very strange because I was a kind of a clown in high school, which I'm, that wasn't a good funny. Like it, this is different. Writing up a comedy is serious and, but you have fun, but it's, it's serious and it's hard and it's work and it's creative. Like, I don't believe in being a clown. That's why you probably didn't know I was funny, but like, on social media, yeah, I like, um, I kind of, um, I, I let my real side up, but now I had business people that I was friends mm -hmm. with, family that knew me, kind of knew my real personality, they did. Um, then business people that did not know that side of me. Uh, and then people I was meeting in the world of comedy that did know that side. So it was a real mix and it was funny. I have comment, you, yeah, everyone was like, I didn't even know this side of you. So it's kind of funny when you see that. So sometimes it was an issue for me with my, business because I'm like, I don't want people to look at me like a clown because if I work in the business and do consulting and business, mm -hmm. they're going to be like, who is this guy? What does he do? Comedy? Does he box? Does he, you know, is he a real estate guy? Is he a consultant? But the truth is you can be all of it. You can. Um, but my persona, I, I'm more of a serious business. I'm very, I do a lot alone. I don't not, I don't keep a big group of people around me. I am, I keep meeting people I care about. Oh, I don't have an answer for that. Is there something else I can I don't know what happened there. Sorry. <laughs> That's weird. It's okay. I got it. <laughs> See how funny you are? 
Well, just because of the sake of time, I do want to just give a quick closing. Once again, we are speaking with Mike Delaquilla. If you are looking to see him be funny, uh, start following him on his social media. What is your Instagram handle? It's Delaquilla M. Delaquilla M. Okay. So we're going to put that out for you. So follow Mike. Um, Stay tuned. Mike has a lot of exciting things coming up in 2024 uh, in reference to his consulting. Uh, But it has been nothing but a pleasure to spend a little bit of time with you today. So until next time, everybody stay tuned. We will see you next week and stay safe. Thank you very much. 